All right, hello everyone, I'm Carly McGuire. Today is World Wildlife Day, which is a very special day for us here at Denver Zoo. And this is going to be a very special virtual safari that we're doing today. We are so honored to be joined by the first gentleman of Colorado, Marlon Reese, for today's Facebook Live. The first in a series of collaborations with the first gentleman. He's written a guest detail vlog for us. He's joining us for today's live. And we hope to have many more collaborations going forward. So thank you for joining us for that. If you are new to Denver Zoo's virtual safaris, or you're just new to Denver Zoo in general, let us tell you a little bit about the zoo. We have been in the community for 125 years. We are celebrating that 125th anniversary this year, so very special for us. Denver Zoo is one of only 240 AZA accredited zoos in the country, which means we meet the highest standards of animal care. And in 2020, we became an American Humane Certified Zoo, which recognizes the good welfare and treatment of all of the animals that we have in our care, including Groucho, who's right behind us. And today we're going to be talking about our Asian elephants with the help of our elephant manager, Laura Davis. And so we're also very excited to be partnering with the first gentleman because Marlon himself is a Colorado native. He grew up going to Denver Zoo, and we are just so thankful and proud for his support of Denver Zoo. He attributes his love of animals to the zoo, and we are teaming up with him because the issues that face animals globally and locally are a concern to both Denver Zoo and the first gentleman. So what we want to do is invite the first gentleman to introduce himself so he can talk a little bit about his passion for Denver Zoo and why he's excited about this collaboration. Marla? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carly, and uh, good afternoon to everyone out there. Uh, I'm just uh, thrilled uh, to be here today with you on World Wildlife Day. Uh, what a, a wonderful occasion to celebrate uh, really the rich tapestry of life uh, that we're all a part of here on, on our beautiful planet Earth. Uh, when I uh, initially spoke with the Denver Zoo uh, about the possibility of working together, um, of course, I was excited. I, I honestly can't think of a more organic partnership uh, for folks who, in their core, appreciate and admire all animals, uh, great and small. Uh, this past year, as we know, has been uh, challenging on so many fronts, but I'm proud of the steps, uh, in particular, that the Denver Zoo has taken in partnership with our state health department uh, to reopen uh, in June of last year in a, in a way that honored the guests and the animals that uh, are at Denver Zoo. Uh, by always prioritizing the health and well-being of employees and guests, the only equal, perhaps even greater, one might say, uh, achievement is how above and beyond the zoo has gone to ensure uh, that the care of the zoo's many beloved animals has continued steadfast and unwavering through this entire process. Uh, to keep the well-being of the people and animals front and center, Denver Zoo has introduced touchless ticketing uh, created a one-way path for guests to take a socially distanced safari through habitats, uh, and traded maps, physical maps, uh, for apps, the sort on our phone, uh, to limit germs and reduce our carbon footprints. Uh, that's a win-win-win, uh, perhaps, for anyone who champions the rights of animals and the healing of our environment. And I really can't wait to see what the zoo has in store for Coloradans this year. Uh, in a recent conversation that I had with uh, Jake QB at the Denver Zoo's communication office, he asked what sparked my love for animals. Uh, after thinking about it for just a moment, uh, I really couldn't think of a time in my life before I loved and admired animals. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, if you're anything like me and the dedicated team members at the Denver Zoo, then uh, certainly you know that there's something in your soul from the moment you're born that draws you to the wondrousness of nature and all the, the vibrant life uh, with whom we share our extraordinary planet. Uh, there's something simple and complex about it. Uh, when we began talking about this event, of course, this event today, uh, and possible topics to go over, uh, my ears really pricked up uh, when the topic of elephants was suggested. Uh, I love all animals equally, but uh, I'll definitely admit that as a young boy, 
Uh, and as I grew older, my very favorite habitat to visit uh, was the pachyderm uh, exhibit. Uh, and don't tell that to my uh, rescue pup, Gia. She'll be very jealous. Uh, so my hope today is uh, that we'll be able to answer some questions uh, that, that you, the viewers, uh, have about Asian elephants. Uh, last week, I met with a specialist at the zoo to get more information on the species. And uh, my love and appreciation for these gentle giants really only increased. Uh, so I hope uh, that we all have the benefit of that same uh, experience today. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Carly. Thank you so much, Carlin. We are so excited for this as well. And I know more of here here at Black Power Farm, but his favorite exhibit to visit was the Pachyderm House when he was a kid growing up. Yeah. So I think this is a really special treat for him and for us because we are really proud of how we care for elephants here at Denver Zoo. So with that being, let me turn it over to Maura Davis, the manager of elephants here at Toyota Elephant Passage, to talk about the, the big guy behind us and a little bit about what we do here at Denver Zoo to care for our game elephants. Thank you, Carly, and very excited to have you here, Marlon, joining us with Groucho. Groucho is the 51-year-old Asian elephant resident here at Toyota Elephant Passage. Now, we opened this beautiful exhibit back in 2012 with the intention of housing male elephants. So we have five male Asian elephants who live here, and um, Groucho is the oldest and largest of them. So at 51 years old, he is about 11,000 pounds, which is a really great size for him, um, especially as he continues to get a little bit older. We want to make sure he stays at a healthy weight. Um, he does have quite an appetite, as you can see, all of the food behind him, and some of his uh, caretakers are giving him some extra treats right now since he is uh, going to be spending some time with us this morning. Absolutely. and. We have five elephants here, and they're not all here with Groucho. So just quickly run through who else we have here. Sure, so uh, the next in age and size to Groucho would be Bodhi. Bodhi was actually the very first elephant who lived here in Toyota Elephant Passage. So you mentioned the Pachyderm building being one of your favorites. Um, Dolly and Mimi, who used to reside in that, uh, in that building, came over here and joined us in Toyota Elephant Passage as well. But Bodhi, the 16-year-old, was the first resident here. He moved here before Dolly and Mimi moved over into this area as well. And then after Bodhi is Billy. Billy just turned 13. He had a birthday party here a couple weeks ago. And after that, we have Chuck. Chuck is 12, so he is next in age to Billy. Um, but Chuck happens to be the smallest, even though he's not the youngest. The youngest goes to Jake. Jake is 11 years old and is half-brother uh, to Chuck. So we do have a, a brother pair here. That's excellent. So before we open this up to questions from the general public, as many of our virtual safari fans know, we love to hear your questions. I do want to kick it back to our first gentleman, Marlon Reese, to see if he has any questions or more about our elephant or Toyota Elephant Passage or the work we do with our elephants both here at Denver Zoo and in the wild. Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, it's it's just thrilling uh, to be able to ask questions and learn about these amazing animals. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Groucho is uh, 51. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, he's 51 years old. That's amazing. So he's older than I am. Uh, do, how long do elephants typically live? Uh, in the wild and then in captivity, sort of yeah. side by side. Uh, did you guys hear? I I was curious about what the, the typical lifespan is for uh, for elephants in captivity and how that compares to their lifespan this in the wild. This is a really popular question. Our governor, uh, the first gentleman, wants to know. This is a very popular question. Sorry, we do have a bit of delay between myself and the first gentleman. So, you have to know what is the average lifespan for Asian elephants, um, both in human care and in their native elephants. 
So it opens the median life expectancy. It's a combined uh, median expectancy, mostly because um, there's not that many of them in, in human care. So um, data is this uh, scarce. Uh, but it is 47 is the median life expectancy for the Asian elephant. And um, obviously at 51, he has surpassed that, uh, that median life expectancy there. So he is considered a geriatric um, elephant. So we do care for him slightly differently than we do our four youngsters. Um, at his age, he does experience a little bit of arthritis in um, his back right leg, which we uh, monitor with annual radiographs, x-rays. Believe it or not, we are able to get x-rays on him right in this location, actually. Um, he voluntarily participates in that health care that, um, that he experiences here. And um, we are very happy that he is in such great health as a 51-year-old. Yeah, we are so happy we, we've got him around to box the other boys around. And if you haven't noticed, we only have males here in our care at Toyota Elephant Active playing why? So naturally, if you have seen um, pictures or videos or documentaries with large herds of elephants, they are matriarchal. So they have a female leader, all of her female friends, offspring, aunts, you know, all the females stay together for, for life. So males, when they have a male offspring, they stay with them until the herd sends them on their way, usually around the age of 6 to 10. Um, and that's where they go off and experience other male elephants. Now, this is something that's relatively new um, to the information we have about elephants. There's not a lot of information out there. We have a lot more to learn. Um, but it has been recently discovered that male elephants spend a lot more time with other males than we originally thought. We all believe that uh, male elephants, once they left their female herd, kind of went off into this solitary lifestyle, only interacting with other elephants when it was time to breed and reproduce. Um, but that is, is not the case. So a lot of young males are, are seen together, engaging in a lot of high energy sparring and pushing one another around, all in good play and fun, of course. And they spend quite a bit of time with large dominant animals who have a wealth of knowledge and experience to um, pass on to the younger generations. And those young males learn a lot from someone of, of Groucho's age. So um, this is something that in North America and in and facilities like ours, there are so many uh, zoos that are doing such a great job reproducing and having young offspring. Um, and if they are males, they need a place to go eventually. And so we have um, built this beautiful exhibit to replicate that uh, life stage for a male elephant in between leaving their, their family group, but before they're old enough and mature enough to be of breeding uh, age. So very important work we do here. How does the work we do, the studies we're able to observe and the behavior of our boys impact research of elephants in the wild across the world? That's a great question. So we've been doing this for about four years. Um, four years ago, we started our very first introduction process with um, Billy and Bodhi, and we've come a long way. We've learned a lot. Billy at the time was very young, straight out of his female herd. He had a lot to learn in terms of appropriateness around other male elephants. And over the course of the last four years, Billy has really matured and absorbed a lot of information from Groucho. And we've seen what that sort of impact an adult male can have on the the growth of a, of a young male as he's maturing. So this is all information that we're able to pass on to um, folks over in Asia who are experiencing conflict with young groups of male elephants. We can really reinforce it's important to have an adult around to kind of keep them in line. Um, they act much more appropriate when Groucho's around. You know, the boss is here, so they, um, they definitely are much more well-behaved when Groucho's um, present. So that sort of information we're able to pass along. And, um, you know, I mentioned that there's not a lot of information about elephants. We, specifically male elephants. Male elephants are difficult to study, especially if you think in Asia, they live in dense forests. So being able to um, find the males that you want to research can be tricky and can potentially be dangerous. Obviously, look how large he is. Um, they can be 
pretty aggressive at times. So it's a dangerous piece too to study them, especially when they're going through their annual hormonal period, which happens about two to three months a year. And um, during that time, we're actually able to get a lot of information that might not be able to study be studied safely over in their range countries. Oh, wow. So I know we're throwing a lot of information at our audiences right now. If you're a fan of Denver Zoo, you have heard a lot of this before. We do a lot of these virtual safaris for our elephants. But I would love to take it back to the first one on the to see if he has any questions about what we've just heard. And if you have questions from the public, feel free to put those in the comments. We'll get to those later in the live as well. Yes. No, I. Uh, it's such a, a treat to hear. Uh, for me personally, I'm sure for everybody to hear about the the zoo doing work that that goes far beyond sort of the, the public facing um, the public facing day to day experience of visitors coming to the zoo and and developing a uh, hopefully a lifelong love of animals uh, and it's this is a, a fascinating. Um, bit of information that I, I think a lot of people probably didn't know was happening, that research was being done at the Denver Zoo uh, that could then be extrapolated and uh, sort of in, in the form of research and a study uh, that could then be applied to real life situations um, in other countries. And so, uh, you know, I, I was curious, um, you know, if, if you guys might talk a little bit too about um, you know, was there a need for understanding, um, you know, how how uh, young male elephants that we normally think go out on their own, um, how they actually stay together and, and what are ways to improve relations between elephants and themselves and elephants and people and whether this, this project sort of emerged out of something that you guys were seeing um, elsewhere in the world, uh, it, perhaps even in wild situations, how the zoo has been able um, to lend its expertise and study issues that were happening out in the wild. All right. The delay. I wanted to make sure I heard the whole question. So, the first one I want to know is how um, our observations and our research have kind of influenced in the wild, how we reduce that human animal conflict, and what we've been able to teach others about how to interact with elephants, especially younger ones that maybe just be on their own from their herds and need a little bit of that appropriate behavior education. So we have recently started supporting a researcher in India. Um, one of my coworkers actually, Gabe, right behind us, was able to travel to India and build this relationship um, with this researcher. And the work he's doing with elephants in particular is amazing. And the piece of the human elephant conflict is obviously one of the biggest issues that is um, being faced right now with elephant conservation. So information that we have learned with Groucho being the leader has helped um, inform some potential policy change. A lot of male elephant groups historically, if um, it had been thought if the adult male is not there, the younger, smaller ones would be easier to manage. Um, but it turns out they are more well behaved when the big male is around. So in terms of you know, chaos in, in young groups, having an adult leader around actually results in more appropriate elephant behavior. Now, this is a newer relationship that we have with them. Uh, the organization is called Feral in India. And the um, potential for collaboration with that team of researchers is amazing. They're doing some really great work redesigning fence lines to help protect uh, farmers' crops from elephant graves. And the uh, like I said uh, earlier with the hormonal phase that male elephants go through, any information we can learn about male elephants that go through this hormonal period will help provide us more information for those researchers in Asia um, who are really trying to work on the ground to help protect the elephants while also protecting the community and finding ways to support them to help conserve the elephants. If you imagine, um, you know, pests, for us in 
North America consists of maybe a fox or a raccoon, or if you live in the mountains here, maybe a bear going through your trash. Um, people who live in rural, rural areas in India are really dealing with elephants in their backyard, um, and if they destroy a crop, that could be their livelihood for six months. Um, so really working to help support those communities as they continue to make these changes, and any information we can provide them is going to be so valuable. Yeah. So if we don't let uh, kids run their, make the rules for themselves, we <laughs> shouldn't let young elephants make the rules for themselves either. And as human spaces, animal spaces continue to become one, uh, we really need to make sure that we're honoring the animals, but we're also honoring the hard work of people in their crops and their livelihoods. Uh, so that's really important work and information we can pass along because we are the only two in North America that have this many unrelated Asian male elephants. So we can really study that behavior. Um, and we are looking also in that impact in the blood as well. So again, something that's not easy for researchers in Asia to collect on wild elephants is a blood sample that really shows us a wide range of the hormonal changes that they go through. And one thing that we are studying right now, we've actually just wrapped up a research project, but some of the um, hormones that we're analyzing is to get an idea of their social bond with one another which is really exciting. So there are certain hormones that have indicated it's been studied in humans, it's been studied in great apes, and um, we're now going to study it with male elephants and see if we can notice changes in their in their hormones that would indicate, you know, Rapha's having a really great time with Bodhi, um, but maybe he's not as close in relationship with Chuck. Um, and so that's something we're still waiting for the analysis of that data to come back, but it's something that we're really looking forward to learning more about the, the bonding factors and the relationships that these male elephants um, can, can develop. Well, I would love to talk more about the must of it all, because I think that's a term we use a few times, but if you're unfamiliar, must is a very important part of elephant management and understanding elephant behavior, but you said the blood draw. So I think it's really important to mention and talk about how we voluntarily get blood from an elephant of this size. <laughs> They, they are quite large, so they're standing here right next to Grasso. Um, with elephant, uh, with our care in general, we do a, a wide variety of different, um, we call them behaviors, where we ask them to voluntarily put parts of their body closer to us for inspection. So right here you can see Grasso lining his body up. We're able to take a look at his skin, his ears, his eyes, his tusks. Um, we're able to get a good look at him, and he's... He's able to walk away if he wants to, and he's choosing to stay here and participate with us. And, and we bring that into every single interaction we have with the elephants here. So when we ask them to give us a blood sample, it is again done with the elephants knowing what the expectation is, and they can choose whether they want to participate or not. So we ask them to back into an area where we're able to get very close to the inside of their back leg. That's where a really uh, large vein is that we are able to collect the blood from. And we do this weekly on all of them to not only monitor their hormones, but we can check to make sure they're really healthy. And we can check for certain diseases that our um, Asian elephants are very highly susceptible to. So we monitor those things very closely. All right, I'd like to pause here and ask if you have any questions or if you're ready to hear about the magic that is must. <laughs> Uh, I, I definitely don't want to put off the magic, but uh, I uh, first of all, I, I love hearing about the, the process of, of getting a blood draw, doing a blood draw on, on the elephants, because we're all now, after the past year, so familiar with uh, having to go to the doctor and undergo tests, and uh, there's a part of me that will always uh, admire uh, sort of the toughness of other species that, uh, you know, they, they're they willing, they're good patients, I guess. That's, uh, that's how I would put it. Um, and one of my favorite things uh, in my previous conversation with the, with the zoo was uh, how all of the different animals have their own ways of um, making themselves good patients. Um, so uh, one, one question that I, I thought uh, might be useful, I found this fascinating, is to just hear a little bit about uh, the way the enclosure at the zoo was built in order to 
uh, to make life every day good for the elephants and, and to ensure that they have the room that they need to feel uh, that they can maintain their personal space and enter and exit sparring matches if, if uh, based on how they feel that day. I thought that was a great uh, accommodation and, and uh, point of pride for the zoo. So Marlon said that I've watched it all on how to be very good patients. Um, I think that's very true and commended all of our animal residents for being such good patients with their health care. But his question was actually about the design of tech, Toyota Elephant Passage, which is a really great one because it allows us to talk about how we manage the different groups. If one isn't monster, isn't really being social, the different yards we have and the different dynamics we can create um, and how it allows them to act as their natural selves. That's great. The, the 10 acres is broken up into five major habitats. And uh, the Asian elephants or the greater one for rhino are able to um, inhabit those spaces. So it really provides a lot of variety for us, um, not just for the elephants, but for the rhinos as well. Now, with the elephants in particular, Every single day, we are closely monitoring their behavior because of this hormonal phase must. During this time, their testosterone skyrockets and could be about 60 times greater than their normal levels. So during this time, they stop eating as much, they lose their appetite, um, they start to drain this secretion from the side of their, of their head where they have a temporal gland right there. Um, they start to smell really bad. There's quite a few things that happen during this time, and the potential for being aggressive towards other elephants is definitely there. Now, each individual is different, so again, that monitoring is very important. And as they become mature, their behavior during that must cycle for each one changes. So there are plenty of times where all five male elephants are able to inhabit um, the same space together, so we'll actually take three or four of those large habitats and combine them into one by opening a series of, of gates and doors. But if they are wanting some solo time, which adult male elephants like Grasso do need their solo time and spend some time without all of the young, young ones around, um, we are able to make those into smaller spaces for um, each elephant to get their alone time. For, for example, today, Groucho is in here, obviously, hanging out with us, but Bodie and Chuck are spending some time together. Billy and Jake are hanging out together. So we are able to keep the social experiences different day to day. It certainly allows them the space to do things like spar, yes. rough house, yes. play. Uh, talk a little bit about the social dynamics. Who's the most playful? Who's the most likely to uh, kind of be told no first. So um, it's interesting. Billy, like I said, he has learned a lot. So at, you know, he's a teenager now. He has days where he really wants to be like a grown up and hang out very calmly. Um, Chuck, who is our 12 year old, is definitely the most social. He wants to play with everybody. Um, and in the summertime, especially, they spend a lot of time in one of the huge pools that we have here. We have over a million gallons of water in Toyota Elephant Passage to really um, provide them space to play in those pools. Asian elephants do really enjoy spending time in the water and Chuck and Billy typically spend quite a bit of time in the summer playing in those pools. In fact, when we get here in the mornings, oftentimes we will find Chuck going for a morning swim uh, before he even has his, his breakfast. <laughs> so. I hope that answers your question, Marlon. And we are coming up on the end of our half hour, so if there's anything else you'd like to ask, I certainly encourage both the public and our first settlement to get in those questions because Mara is, has so much more information to share. <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, I'll throw in there uh, one other, one last question uh, and not take up time away from, uh, from viewers, but uh, you know, I, I love the idea and the reality that the zoo is performing uh, such an extraordinary service on behalf of animals uh, with the conservation programming uh, that the zoo is doing. And uh, too often, I think it's it's been easy, perhaps too easy, to typecast uh, institutions that are working to help animals. 
And so, um, you know, I, I would love to just give you guys an opportunity because there are so many great questions and I'm such a fan, I'll, I'll wanna do this myself, but how can, how can myself and others find out more about some of the exciting conservation work that the zoo is doing uh, for the elephants uh, and also for other species that the zoo is working on? And how can we find out more about uh, how the zoo is, in, is plugged in globally uh, to, uh, to the conservation work of helping animals in need. Absolutely, it's a great question. Marlon well, wants to know how uh, visitors, guests, audiences who maybe don't come to the zoo can learn more about what we're doing for conservation uh, globally, even locally. And I'd say a great resource is our website, denverzoo.org. We have a blog called Zoo Tales, and we have articles about us, the research we've done with Asian elephants. So those are great resources to look at. We have a conservation page, which means a lot of access. We definitely encourage people to look there. I also know we have a few guest questions from people in the comment section. Um, does poaching affect Asian elephants? It does. It's definitely more of an issue in Africa with the African species. Habitat loss and um, human elephant conflict is definitely a really big issue for the Asian elephant. Um, but there are instances of poaching, absolutely. But one of the biggest um, differences between the two species is that only male Asian elephants have the ivory tusks. So in Africa, the African elephant, both females and males have tusks. So just naturally, there's a lot more um, to be poached, unfortunately. Um, but yes, it is, it is definitely an issue in Asia as well, but not the biggest problem that the Asian elephant is facing. And are there more Asian or African elephants in the wild? So there are more African elephants Asian elephants are an endangered species, and African elephants are considered threatened because they do have greater numbers than this species. So Asian elephants are endangered because there's only about 30,000 of them left worldwide, and that includes the five bulls who live here at Edgar And what other issues, we talked a lot about the human-animal uh, conflict of, of Asian elephants being a major fight to them. What are some of the other issues facing them in the wild and why their numbers are going down. So one thing that is impacting the Asian elephant, like I said, is habitat loss. So their forests are being removed in order to, whether it's plant other crops or establish new living space for humans. Um, one thing that is an issue for many Asian species, endangered species, um, is the production of non-sustainable palm oil. So that's one thing that definitely has an impact um, as you guys go to the grocery stores and you're looking at products that you purchase in your houses, um, trying to find products that use sustainably sourced palm oil would make a huge impact on many endangered species uh, that live in Asia. Absolutely. And for a fun one, what do you, what do you describe Dragos' personality? Like, you know, he's kind of the big boss, the Don of the Passage. But what if you like this on an elephant to keep a level? He is a very patient and very laid back. He's very calm. As you can see, um, he really spends some quality time with some of his animal care staff. And um, if there's food around, Greco will be there. So that's something that, um, especially his hay, as you can see, we provided him a lot of hay and snacks right now. Um, he really is a, an easygoing elephant, really patient, great teacher, um, and we, all, we, we definitely learn a lot from getting any, any special time with Draco. What is your favorite part about being uh, a keeper here to the elephant message? My favorite part of this whole thing is um, being able to build relationships with each individual animal is different for every single person who comes in. Every relationship is different. But through that training process we talked about where everything is voluntary, we have really special and unique relationships with these guys that are very positive and built on a lot of trust. And so being able to communicate through training um, and through our trusting relationships with an animal who does not speak our same language, obviously, um, that's a real highlight for me to see an elephant learn something new or for 
especially if we have one of us that has a, a really interesting moment or a really special connection. I think that's my favorite part. Yeah. Who would you say Groucho gets so long with Becker? Which of the younger bulls is taking after Groucho the most? That is a great question. Um, I think to kind of answer both, I think Groucho really enjoys spending time with Bodie. They're very calm together. They just they're very relaxing. It, it's not a lot of work for Grappo because Bodhi is 16, he's maturing, he has that same sort of calm demeanor as he's getting older. But we really do see Grappo and Chuck engage very well together. Chuck is learning a lot. Um, just about a year ago, we actually saw Chuck is very small, he's about half the size of Grappo. And we actually saw Grappo get down on the ground. Um, completely sternal, his belly was touching the ground in order to get on Chuck's level to play with him out in one of the, the large outdoor habitats. And that was a really great moment to see them really start to connect on that level. A moment we captured on our security cameras about a year, maybe two years at this point, after, after Chuck and Jake first got to Denver Zoo from their last home in Canada, was a moment where they actually both felt comfortable and safe enough to lay down. And I think that's something not a lot of people realize elements do, they assume they sleep standing up, but explain why that was really significant when we saw that. When an elephant lays down, they become uh, much more vulnerable, and so when we see an elephant laying down, especially in the uh, company of uh, another elephant, especially one who is a new acquaintance or, or a, a developing relationship, that is a really important moment for us because we know that they are feeling safe, they are not anxious about the elephant who is with them. So when Chuck and Jake first arrived, we had a few milestones that we were recognizing were important in terms of their comfort here in Toyota the Elephant Passage. And especially once they've been learning the, the ropes here and building those relationships with the other elephants they didn't know at the time, seeing those milestones of laying down, um, sleeping together overnight, we have them housed together overnight in, in social um, scenarios, which is really exciting. So I'll kick it back to Marlon. I, I can see he's got a big smile on his face, so I, I hope you're enjoying this. I hope everyone is enjoying it as much as we are. So let us know if you have a question. It's so great. I love it. I um, I get to be a fan, which is really what I am. I'm just a fan of, of the work the zoo does. I, I love seeing Groucho in the back there, and uh, he's putting a big smile on my face. Um, I. Uh, Incidentally, it, it struck me as funny when you mentioned that, uh, you know, being in a, pro, a laying down makes you vulnerable because uh, I was in that exact situation last night when I was playing with my kids uh, who are nine and six. And I need to think better of laying down and putting myself within reach of them. Uh, after what happened last night, they all kind of dog piled on top of me. but. Uh, I actually had just a, a fun question that I, I figured uh, the audience might enjoy as much as me, and and that's um, what are what is Groucho's favorite food to eat? Uh, because you guys have such an incredible comprehensive nutrition program, uh, and uh, one of the things that strikes me as amazing about the zoo is just uh, how uh, fastidious the zoo is in in providing really complete nutrition, but also just in terms of what does he like the best? Oh, well, it sounds like first one is talking about the zoo nutrition, which we have a big series of videos on on our YouTube page. If you go to Denver Zoo on YouTube, you'll see a lot about how we feed our animals. It is a massive undertaking but specifically we want to know what uh Groucho's favorite food is believe it or not so ele the elephant's main diet here is made up of a grass hay that is um, locally grown uh, all the elephants get an individual amount of that hay based on their growth state so Groucho's are only full-grown elephants so he is at a, a diet where we make sure we maintain the, the weight that he is at. So he eats about 120 pounds of this hay um, every day. He gets treats for um, training sessions or husbandry or medical care. So that includes sweet potatoes or broccoli, bananas, all sorts of delicious treats. 
But believe it or not, his absolute favorite thing is his hay. The main part of his diet is hands down his favorite part. And lucky for him, he gets quite a bit of it throughout the day. <laughs> like giving a special award is for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly what you want to be is their favorite food. So that's why I like these. I do think you find sweet potato, apple pieces here that are being mixed in with the hay. It's a little thank you for being so patient and staying with us here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes sense. My, I think my favorite, uh, my favorite food is just plain rice. Uh, I, I love it. It's the simplest food to get, but it's my favorite. So, something else we've got in common. <laughs> uh, well, he's um, he. I one other thing that I, I wanted to highlight just, uh, and it was just something that that you guys had been talking about, but just the rice, which is uh, <laughs> easy, to eat, easy to eat, and probably not my most favorite food, but. <laughs> I, uh, I love how the individual treatment that the zoo provides, the indi individual relationships that each caretaker has with, with the animals, uh, because that's something else I think doesn't, uh, isn't immediately obvious to just your once a year zoo goer is that uh, every single animal at the zoo is seen as an individual and uh, and you guys see them as residents and uh, so the other question was I, I just was curious what a what a good morning scenario might look like when when a caretaker first gets to see the animal that they're assigned to uh, in the morning. Do you guys hug, <laughs> or do you say hi, good morning? <laughs> sure. So first, I'm in thanking us for you know treating every animal like an individual, which we absolutely do from the way they eat, from the way they're cared for, and on an individual level. But you want to know what is a typical morning scenario like when you come in? And you see the animals we're caring for. We don't give them a hug, but we do give them a, a big hello. Oh, we do. The mornings are really fun. It's easy for us all to get up and come and do our jobs. We are really passionate about what we do. And our morning starts at 7 a.m. And we come in and feed all of the elephants a nice big breakfast, make sure everyone is doing well. Uh, we actually check their sleep from overnight to make sure, especially this guy, to make sure that he has slept quite a bit. Um, it's hard to see past him right now, but there is actually a giant sand mound over there that is his pillow. So he spends his evenings getting a nice soft sand pillow to sleep on. So we check his, his sleep patterns, make sure everything looks good there. Um, and then we will clean a little bit and start determining which elephants need what sort of social experience for the day. And that's how we determine um, which part of the habitat they will spend some time in. And um, like I said, we watch them very closely throughout the day, um, making sure that everything is looking looking really good, making sure everyone's acting appropriate. Um, but we do have a lot of fun uh, giving them new toys and that sort of thing. We, we do spend a lot of time, especially um, Chuck the other day, was actually in this space and was having an absolute time of his life playing with one of the large balls in the back there. He was laying on the ground and kind of rolling his shoulders on it and trumpeting and throwing sand in the air. It was really fun to see them kind of engage with pieces of their environment. Um, so our mornings typically start with, with food for them, and that's a pretty common piece throughout the day. And we feed them about 15 times a day, so there's definitely a lot of quality time spent with them. Definitely. It's always work in the morning. We're getting, we're getting out to eat up. We're getting food prepared. Uh, but someone asks, uh, do you how do we keep social animals so far? This will be our last question before we wrap it up. Um, so I'd like to ask. That's a great question. So we, um, like I said, in the mornings when we get here, we discuss who should be socialized, who would do, and that is based on the time of year, who's in must, who spent the day yesterday with some solo time, making sure that they all get to engage in a what they would like to. So Chuck, he spends a lot more time socialized than Grandpa does because he seems to really um, desire it. He seems to really be engaged in social interaction. So we make sure he gets more social time than maybe Groucho does. Um, but like I said, it changes day to day depending on um, a whole variety of factors. But um, it's definitely something we're really 
proud to have been able to accomplish with all five of these guys and watching their, their relationships develop. And they are all very unique relationships, um, but they make up a really, really wonderful and dynamic bachelor group. Thank you so much, Maura. Thank you to Marlon, our first son of Colorado, for joining us for this. I'll hand it over to you for any last thoughts or comments before we wrap it up. But thank you from both of us for this collaboration, and we cannot wait to keep it going. And when everything is safe, bring you here in person to see these wonderful people. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a delight for me to, uh, to be able to uh, be here with you guys today, to uh, be with Groucho, and uh, I'm, I'm so looking forward to this being the first of an ongoing series of uh, collaborations with, uh, with our very own Denver Zoo. Such a, a credit to Colorado and a credit to all of the extraordinary people uh, we have here in the state. Uh, who just like me, just like you guys, are animal lovers through and through. Uh, and uh, this is just a, a great opportunity, I think, for anyone who already loves the zoo to uh, find out what happens behind the scenes. And, uh, and for those who are not yet fans to become fans uh, of the uh, really life-saving work that you guys do. Uh, and I say that just as a, a complete fan. Uh, I've loved every minute of today, and I can't wait to uh, to talk to you guys again for our next episode. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. We will see you next time.